Good morning, Anthem. Go ahead and have a seat. I'm so glad that you're here with us to worship. Um, we want to welcome you. If this is your first time here, we especially want to welcome you. I'm Pastor Josh. I'm one of the pastors here at Anthem. Uh, if this is your first time here, uh, we'd love to connect with you, to meet with you, to pray with you. You can text this number, text Anthem to 55498. Uh, you can select the first time guest uh, option, fill it out, and come back to our Growing Disciples booth at the back after the service. Um, and we have a little gift bag for you. Uh, we'd love to connect with you. Um, at this time, uh, we would like to uh, take up the offering. And uh, so uh, we see this as an act of worship, continuing on in worship. So we're going to invite our ushers to come forward, and uh, they're going to take up the offering. And um, you can give a couple different ways. You can give by texting Anthem to 55498, and, uh, or you can uh, give, uh, give uh, through the buckets as the ushers pass them through here. A um, couple announcements that we want to share with you as we move forward here. We're going to be kicking off small groups here um, on September 30. And this is just a ministry that we have here at Anthem that helps us to be able to connect with each other on a deeper level. We've been running them for the past couple of years uh, in our houses. Um, and we've had about 15 different groups running. And so if you're interested in uh, joining a group, uh, learning more about this community, uh, we'd love for you to connect. We have a quick video here that we're going to show this moment. What stood out for me was the willingness and eagerness of our participants, our guests, to join the group to, to really become vulnerable with each other, to share and be open. Um, that really stood out because it, it, it's, you, know, you don't get that opportunity to really open up with people in a large setting, no less a smaller setting, you even clam up even more. But this group was really eager and willing to become vulnerable with one another. I joined a small group in my previous church, but it was all like a women's group. And we mainly focus on the lesson plan and just going through the like the series, which I think is important and that is something we do in our current small group. But what stood out to me the most is just the fellowship that we have. Like our small group leaders started incorporating meals and as a student, a free meal is always welcomed. But it was just a great time to get to know each other and just form really genuine relationships together. What I would tell someone who's thinking of joining is to take the risk and do it. Um, as an introvert, it was definitely something outside my comfort zone. So um, it was it was great because you realize that people are sharing the same concern, the same issues, the same they have the same questions, uh, trying to understand God. So it's just it has really enriched my spiritual walk. <laughs> So we'd love to have you join, and like I said, you can text this number or uh, come out to one of the iPads and sign up with us for those small groups starting here pretty soon. Uh, we're so thankful for all our group leaders who are leading those groups. Uh, so yeah, sign up for a small group. Um, one thing I want to mention, if you are here and you are looking for lunch today, uh, our lead reader, Michelle, is having lunch at her place. If you're looking for a place for lunch, she's going to be out at the back at our Growing Disciples booth. We'd love to connect with you and get you a place uh, for lunch this afternoon. Um, want to give you an announcement uh, from someone special here. We have Pastor Jamie's going to come up, and she's going to tell you a little bit about what's going on. Hi, Anthem. It's good to be with you this morning. I have two both important and fun announcements for you or invitations rather the first one is for something called safe talk um, both of these things i'm offering you are happening on the same day but at different times so safe talk is a suicide prevention training um, this training is available to anyone actually 15 years old and older this is very important for anyone to participate in you never know when a friend, a colleague, a peer might have a problem, and this would give you some tools and skills to be able to help them. So you can register, you can use this QR code, you can register on our website, lluc.org. My 
particular ministry is actually called You Thrive. We do have a website. It's called youthrivelluc.com. So you can find the same information there as well. So you have a few options. Um, so please consider registering. It is free. And it will be directly after our fourth service. So around 1.15 here in this building, first floor. Space is limited and we will be providing you a lunch. So that's why we need you to register so we know how many to expect. Our next event happening the same day um, is actually quite important in conjunction with suicide prevention. Um, it's called, our event will be called Connection Fair. And my ministry is kind of branching in this area of a program called Connection. Uh, because they're, with such a large church, we need to find more ways to connect. Um, loneliness is such an epidemic in our society, and unfortunately, even though this is a very large community with you know many mindsets that are the same, people I hear still have a hard time to connect. So we're looking at providing various types of events that will provide social opportunities, connection, conversation. So this event is happening in the evening, 6.30 in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, it is a ticketed event. We do need to plan and prepare for you. But there's really cool things that will be happening here. We're going to have live music, we're going to have games, we're going to have food, and we're also going to have some prizes available for you. In fact, our, our top prize, or our grand prize, is a helicopter ride for two along the Orange County coast. So uh, please come. Now, if you bring a guest, you'll get a one raffle ticket toward our prizes. If you bring a guest of the opposite sex, you'll get two raffle tickets. <laughs> There'll be additional ways that you can get raffle tickets while you're there as a part of the program. So I hope you'll consider registering. Again, same situation. You can uh, scan this QR code. You can go to LLUC.org or youthrivellluc.com. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Jamie. We are in the last part of our series with Pastor Randy, Revelation, but different. So just invite you at this time to take out your phones, your pens, your notebooks, your Bibles, and let's begin to engage with what God has for us this morning. Good to see you all here. Thank you very much. So six weeks ago today, we started this journey through the book of Revelation. I've been asked on occasions throughout these weeks, what made you decide to talk about Revelation? I have to say there are a range of different reasons, but maybe one of the principal ones was that as pastors, we kind of get a lot of questions. People ask us about a range of different things. And I begin to notice that as the state of our world gets increasingly challenging, I kept having people ask me things about, what does Scripture say about the end, the coming of Christ? What does it have to say about that? So much so that I thought, okay, this is something we need to wade into. And you can't do that really, without considering Revelation. There was a problem because I've never been enamored with Revelation. Revelation was an enigmatic, challenging book, a scary, violent book. So what do we do with that? A year and a half or two ago, I started a deeper dive into the book and have consistently stayed at it. In doing that, I noticed that one or two questions, key questions emerged. The first question that emerged was, what about Jesus? This book claims to be a revelation from Jesus or the revelation of Jesus. Where is he in the middle of all this? All the chaos, all the destruction, all the violence, where is Jesus? But as the layers were peeled back one at a time, a picture of Jesus, who he is, what he is, how he works, what he does, began to emerge a compelling picture of the Jesus of the Gospels. 
As that was happening, a second question began to guide my thinking. And that was the question of, who is God? This God of Revelation, who is it? Is this the violent God we're told that exists in the Old Testament? Is this a different God, a God that's just out to get vengeance? The kind of God that says, stop your crying or I'll give you something to cry about? That kind of God. Who is this God? But again, as the layers were peeled back, there began to emerge a picture of a tender God of the apocalypse. So much so that all these months later, I can say with honesty, Revelation has become deeply woven into me, a book that I have come to truly love. Now, I have to say one thing that I said the first week once again. Thanks to Rob and Vimala Abraham, a precious couple back in the D.C. area, we were able to spend some time on the island of Patmos. As I have gone through this study now, I've realized just how critical that time was. Unhurried time away from the crush and the haste of life to just simmer in the juices of Scripture in a place where we believe God pulled the curtain back on eternity was invaluable. Now, there was another thing that happened. Along the journey in Revelation, some surprises, in fact, quite a few surprises emerged. No surprise has been more precious to me than the surprise of how the book ends. The surprise that can be captured in that statement, heaven cares about our destiny. About what the kingdom of God will look like, will be like, how we will fit into that. That's been a deeply meaningful part of the experience because the truth is we don't know that much about what the kingdom will be like when it is finally and fully realized. Scripture doesn't say all that much about it. There are some hints that appear along the way. For example, some believe that the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 2 is referring to the kingdom of God, though he's also referring to God's plan in our own lives there, that he's also referring to the kingdom of God when he says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the human heart the things that God has prepared for those who love him. If that's what Paul is referring to, it's given rise to some interesting realities. How we conceive of the kingdom of God to come. For example, it seems to me that one of the ways the kingdom of God is conceived of is as a radical discontinuity to our life in the here and now. A radical discontinuity. In other words, it will be radically different than what life is here and now. Occasionally, you'll see that emerge from the artist's brush and palette and, and paints. And you'll see the painting that has been painted of the kingdom of God. And look at it and furrow your brow and think, if that's it, I'm not even sure I want to go there. So different. A radical discontinuity. On the other hand, it has also led to what I would call a romantic continuity. A romantic continuity. In other words, you see this emerge in a lot of different places in the popular culture, that there's a romantic sense of what the kingdom of God is going to be, and it's really going to be just like it is right here, and the things that I like, the people that I like, that's the kind of stuff that's going to be present there. You might find it in song, country music, maybe. When I get there, I'm going to take my dog and my rifle. I'm going to go out, and I'm going to shoot me an eight-point buck, bring it back, have a barbecue, break open a brewski. And, we're, and I'm saying, wait, 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 where, where is that in the text? And I'm trying to figure out, what are you talking about? Romantic continuity. Or my mom. Somebody signed her high school autograph book saying, Betty Jo. That's my mom's name. My dad's Bobby Lee. <laughs> Betty Jo, when you get to heaven and have nothing to do, just dig a hole and pull me through. <laughs> kind of this romantic sense of what it's going to be. And yeah, that's probably not it. So then what is it like? What will it be like? What if, what if rather than a romantic continuity... There is a realistic continuity between the kingdom of God 
and what we experience now in the best and the most robust kinds of ways. So we come to the last two chapters of Revelation. We cannot hope to begin to process all that's there. We're going to look at just one element of what is there. Now, I want to remind you, Revelation is written in symbolic language. So as we read in a moment from Revelation 21, we're going to read a description of the city, the New Jerusalem. And as we read it, we will read of size and dimensions and, and beautiful places and, and symmetry and proportions and, and jewelry and all kinds of things. M may I just say this? Remember this. We've said this before. When you come to Revelation and you encounter numbers, it is very possible that rather than thinking about math, you need to think about theology. The same thing may be true here. When we come to all the dimensions, the sizes, the elements that make up the city, rather than thinking about architecture, we need to think about theology. Because there are meanings that emerge from the descriptions. There is no way we can get into all of that today. But just bear that in mind. It's an important element of what happens here. So we go to Revelation 21. But I want to give you one alert before we read it. Here's the alert. We have encountered already three times in our study of Revelation these moments when John hears one thing and he turns to look and see, and when he turns to look and see, he sees something different. But even though they're, the different, in, they're different, in the end they're the same. Chapter 1, John heard a voice like a trumpet. He turned to see the voice and he saw a figure. It was the Christ figure. Chapter 5, when he's weeping over the scroll and the fact that no one is found worthy to open the scroll, he hears a voice that says, take heart, the lion of the tribe of Judah will open it. And he turns to look and he sees a slaughtered lamb. Different, but the same. And then when he was considering the, the saved people of God, he hears the number, 144,000. He turns to look and he sees a numberless multitude. Different, but the same. Could it be that that's what we experience here in Revelation 21? Because John will be told, he will hear, you're going to see the wife, the bride of the Lamb. And then when he gets a chance to look and see, what he sees is the new Jerusalem, the holy city. Different, but maybe the same. Is God giving John Clues to say, look, where my people are, that's my city. Almost like one beloved says to the other, sweetheart, wherever you are, that's home. I don't care where it is. Maybe that's what he's saying. So let's read Revelation chapter 21, starting in verse 9. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. That's what he hears. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a mountain, great and high, and showed me, this is what he sees, the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square. As long as it was wide, he measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, as wide and high as it is long. By the way, a perfect cube. The only other place we find a perfect cube in Scripture is describing the most holy place of the temple, the actual presence of God. That's what he's saying here. Remember, not about architecture, but theology. The angel measured the wall using a human measurement. It was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. 
The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it its light and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates be shut for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book. Of life. That's a surprise. That's compelling. Because you see, when you read the narrative of Scripture, it doesn't take a chapter or two to realize this. The story of God and the human race begins in Eden, it begins in a garden, a garden of Edenic beauty. That's where it starts. And then comes the fall, and then you have the cosmic conflict, chaos, catastrophe, destruction. And now, the last two chapters, we come back to the earth made new. God's creative genius has been at work once again. And now we're able to start over. So our natural thought would be, the natural assumption would be, we are going back to the garden. But instead of the garden, what we discover is that the story that began in a garden ends in a city. And that's puzzling, profoundly puzzling. Because you see, throughout the biblical narrative, cities are not typically good for the people of God. City after city after city could be named as evidence of that. Babel, Python and Ramesses, the cities of Egypt where God's people were held as slaves, Sodom, Gomorrah, Tyre, Edom, Nineveh, and by the way, especially Babylon. Babylon right here in Revelation is the key city, the important city. This is the city that opposes everything for which God's people stand. So when you look at the city in the story, in the sweep of Scripture, you say, city's not good. It's a problem. So why does the story that begins in a garden end in a city? In fact, there's one dramatic exception to this, and that's the city of Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem, the ideal city according to the writers of Scripture, both Old and New Testament. The highest city on all the earth, even though it's not really the highest by any stretch. But you will find that in the Scripture, you never go down to Jerusalem, you always go up. And when you re leave Jerusalem, you never go up, you always go down. It is the key city. That's the city of Scripture. And then we come to Revelation, and Jerusalem is not there. Absent. City's not good. And yet, the text tells us that what began in a garden ends in a city. Now, New Jerusalem is there. That's what we read about here. In fact, is it New Jerusalem City or is this the bride, the wife of the Lamb? In fact, those two are so, are so connected together in this passage that the NIV gives this section, this heading, the New Jerusalem, comma, the bride of the Lamb. That somehow they are different, yet they are the same city. Why is it that that happens? What is God trying to tell us? Well, we go back to the very beginning of the story, and we remember that when humanity was created and placed in this Edenic paradise, this garden, they were told, they were given instructions to subdue the earth 
and to have dominion over it. Two statements, two commands that have been among the most abused and horrific commands, the misunderstanding of which has led to incredible damage on this thing called planet Earth. Because what God was really saying is care for it, nurture it, guide it, use your creativity on it to take its beauty and to increase it. But instead of hearing that humanity heard, we own it and we will treat it exactly as we wish to treat it. And in the end, we have come close to destroying it, especially in the cities. So that original command, responding to the creativity that God wove into the human genome, once the fall came, it got twisted and led in what still has some evidence of the vision that God had, but has become largely damaging and destructive and horrific for the human race. And yet, God has not given up. Because what started in a garden ends in a city. Listen to the words of New Testament scholar Richard Bauckham, who writes this. In the beginning, God planted a garden for humanity to live in. In the end, he will give them a city. In the New Jerusalem, the blessings of paradise will be restored, but the New Jerusalem is more than paradise regained. As a city, it fulfills humanity's desire to build out of nature a human place of human culture and community. True, it is given by God and so comes down from heaven. But this does not mean humanity makes no contribution to it. It consummates human history and culture insofar as these have been dedicated to God. While excluding the distortions of history and culture into opposition to God that Babylon represents. It comes from God in the sense that all good comes from God. And all that is humanly good is best when acknowledged to come from God. But the city that both includes paradise unspoiled and is adorned with the beauty of paradise points to that harmony of nature and human culture to which ancient cities once aspired, but to which modern cities have increasingly betrayed. God says, I have created you with an innate desire to think and to dream and to build, to be creative, to do things with the material world that I have given you that will stun me. It's yours. Do amazing things with it. And then the fall. And that original creativity does not complete, completely disappear, but gets profoundly twisted. But we still see evidences of it. Because after all, is it not in the city that we see some of the truly great realities of the human endeavor? Isn't it commonly from the cities that come the arts? and architecture, and art, and music, and education, and science, and technology, and medicine, and research, and all of the other things that humanity continues to work out as it responds to that creative reality that God wove into our fabric. Amazing things. But tainted by a fallen nature. You know what's particularly amazing in that passage we just read? We're talking about the city of God. Did you notice those words? The glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it. The kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. John is saying there will be contributions from humanity that are part of the city of God. Now, lest we get nervous, he immediately says, oh, by the way, nothing impure will enter. That's how he ends the passage. Don't get fidgety. This will not be what has been affected by the fall, but you as humanity will contribute to the city of God because you are his bride. You are the city of God. 
Sigmund Tonstead writes about this with these words. God turns the city, the Bible's embodiment of rebellion and futility, into a symbol of reconciliation, community, and permanence. Nothing captures this better than the announcement that the new Jerusalem is the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Communion vies with community as the best way to describe this new existence. Aspiration exceeds reality for all the cities in history except one, the city not built on and by force. In this city, culture, commerce, and celebration do not cease. Where their harp is playing on their harps, the harps even described as the harps of God, or light, or trade, in the negation called Babylon, the voice of the bridegroom and bride will be heard no more, but it is precisely the voice of the bridegroom and bride that will be heard at journey's end in the city made ready as a bride beautified for her husband. When John proceeds to describe various features of the city in terms that are strange even for symbolic language, these impressions are confirmed and deepened. Architecture is now a vehicle for theology. Aesthetics blends with ethics, and the transparent politics of heaven is exported to earth. So what if there is a realistic continuity between here and there? The kind of continuity for which God originally designed us. I was in college. Floyd Brzee, senior pastor of our church, preached a sermon on heaven. I don't remember anything he said except his key line, which I have never forgotten. It was simply this. You were designed for heaven. You will never function fully till you get there. You were designed for heaven. You will never function fully till you get there. So we have within us those yearnings, those desires for permanence, for something beyond what we have in the here and now, something that nothing in the world can satisfy. C.S. Lewis says those yearnings, those desires are evidence that we were made for another world. I will sit in my office across the courtyard and look at the books I want to read every one of them, learn every one. I, I buy them faster than I can read them. Makes me think of Ivan Blazin, my dear colleague at the School of Religion, who had many books. He said, people will come into my office, they'll look and say, have you read all these? He says, mm -hmm. I've read some of them twice. <laughs> it's a good way to avoid the question and still look good. <laughs> and I've come to realize I will never in this world be able to do that. But that yearning, that desire is a calling for another world. Another world where it says, God says, that is what I designed into you, what I wove into your fabric, Randy. This is my promise to you that when you are here, then everything that you were originally designed for, you will be able to do as you make contributions to the city of God. This coat that I'm wearing, this belonged to my father. My father was bigger than me. The tailor was busy. He was about four inches taller than me, more muscular. His waist was a little smaller, which I'm trying to get over. But I wear it today as a promise promise that though dad's body was ravaged by Parkinson's before he went to his rest, there will come a day when together in the city of God, we grow throughout eternity. Maybe you sit there and say, that's a bridge too far, Randy. Listen to these words. Book, Great Controversy, Ellen White, just one sentence. A fear of making the future inheritance seem too material, too real, in other words, too much of a realistic continuity. A fear of making the future inheritance seem too material has led many to spiritualize away the very truths that lead us to look upon it as our home. 
I don't want to make it seem too material. I don't want to make it seem too much like here. So all those things are spiritual, and pretty soon it doesn't feel anything like home. When we come to John, John says, no, 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 no. It started in a garden, but it ends in a city, and you will contribute to that city. You will be the city in the sense that your contributions will be brought into it. Have you ever considered that God is like a parent? God is like a grandparent who looks at those grandbabies and says, I want you to do everything I've dreamed of, any way I can contribute to that. God is like a parent who looks at those, I mean, I look at my kids and think, I did that. Well, I mean, Anita had something to do with it, but anyway, stay with me. And when they accomplish more than we ever could have, we just sit back and say, my, 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 look at that. You are my children in whom I take great pleasure. What if that is God? In the midst of the city that are his people, looking at the creativity that is expressed, what he has woven at its fundamental level into their being is now finding expression in every possible way. And God just says, my, my, my. Look at that. Those are my kids, my family. Back to great controversy. There, speaking of the kingdom of God, there the redeemed shall know even as they also are known. You've worried, will you know each other? There you will know even as also you are known. The loves and sympathies which God himself has planted in the soul shall there find truest and sweetest exercise. There, immortal minds will contemplate with never-failing delight the wonders of creative power, the mysteries of redeeming love. There is no cruel, deceiving foe to tempt to forgetfulness of God. In other words, the mud-slinging slanderer is done. Every faculty will be developed. Every capacity increased. The acquirement of knowledge, student, will not weary the mind or exhaust the energies. There, the grandest enterprises may be carried forward, the loftiest aspirations reach, the highest ambitions realized, and still there will arise new heights to surmount, new wonders to admire, new truths to comprehend, fresh objects to call forth the powers of mind and soul and body. All the treasures of the universe will be open to the study of God's redeemed. And the years of eternity, as they roll, will bring richer and still more glorious revelations of God and of Christ. As knowledge is progressive, so will love, reverence, and happiness increase. The more humans learn of God, the greater will be their admiration of his character. As Jesus opens before them the riches of redemption and the amazing achievements in the great controversy with Satan, the hearts of the ransom thrill with more fervent devotion and with more rapturous joy they sweep the harps of gold and 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of voices unite to swell the mighty chorus of praise. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love. It began in a garden, but it ends in a city. Because with God's creation and empowerment and guidance, that's where it was headed to begin with. Because human beings have been created with the creativity of God, the thirst for learning, the desire to accomplish. You will never function fully Till you get there because there is what you were designed for.
And so we come to the end. How to capture Revelation. How to summarize this enigmatic yet beautiful book, this puzzling yet profound book. Well, I've chosen to do it with one sentence. Just one sentence. It's a sentence from a sermon from years ago, I think near as I can estimate almost 40 years ago. I didn't hear the sermon. It was shared with me with doc, by Dr. Peter Landless, physician who leads the General Conference Department of Health Ministries. It's a line he heard and never forgot in a sermon preached by that great prince of Adventist pulpiteers, Henry Wright. So it is Henry Wright's sentence that I want to use as the summary of our study of the book of Revelation. And it is simply this, the handkerchief of Revelation wipes away, the handkerchief of Revelation wipes away the tears of Genesis. handkerchief of revelation wipes away the tears of Genesis. And the one holding that handkerchief will be none other than the tender God of the apocalypse. No wonder no wonder John ends his book by saying, even so, come, Lord Jesus.